Welcome to the Love Fly podcast. It's Paul Tizar, Fear of Flying Coach. And today's guest is Gita. And Gita has come to us through the Facebook group Love Fly. And uh, I just want to say a huge thank you for all that you've done and massive welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much and massive thank you to you too for everything you do, hosting the group, the books, the podcast. It's all brilliant, as you Brits say. <laughs> <laughs> right, we're going to just stop there. It doesn't get any better than that. So, uh, yeah, thanks ever so much for coming, Gita. It's brilliant. I said it again. Tell us a little bit about how you came to be here. Or talk, in fact, tell us, about, tell us about yourself and then we'll talk sure. about your fear of flying story. Sure, absolutely. So the nutshell version of who is Gita is I am going to be 50 this year. Yay! P- pause for applause. <laughs> and you I want me am... to put some applause in? That? Well, I'm, I, I could probably do it. <laughs> the crowd goes wild. Woo! <laughs> it's a big birthday. So I live in New England. I live south of Boston in coastal mm-hmm. Massachusetts. I live at a place called Three Dog Farm with, you guessed it, three dogs and a husband and lots of veggies and chickens and all of that. And I live here, and this is also the same place where I teach yoga and I teach clarinet, classical clarinet, and I'm also a writer. So that's me in a very small nutshell. You can usually find me digging in the dirt or writing stuff or teaching someone something. Wow. (laughs) Wow. Okay. Oh, I think I'm slightly uh, humbled now by that. That's uh, awesome. So So the thing I particularly noticed about you, and there's a few... Uh, lovely culprits that do this in the Facebook group is that you're posting on there doing positive stuff sharing little tips yourself and so I thought it'd be really interesting and I know that probably like yourself a lot of people like to hear other people like them so understand their own journey and somebody said it the other day I can't remember who said it but they said I've learned something from every podcast you know like a little tip or a reminder or something so we're looking for wisdom, Gita. Looking for wisdom. <laughs> no, pressure. no pressure. No pressure. Yeah, no pressure. Yeah. Well, gosh, I mean, friends listening, hello. I love you all. Hello, hello, hello. High fives to everyone, no matter like where you are. And to give you hope, I can tell you in March of this year, so we're recording this in June, but in March of this year, my fear of flying did not keep me grounded. I actually was able to get on the plane. So especially big props to you if you're still crossing that threshold of getting on the mm. jetway and getting on the plane. But I was able to fly, but I literally did the flight three breaths at a time. Like I couldn't look out the window. I couldn't look up. I couldn't interact with anybody. It was just take one breath at a time, uh, three breaths at a time. And then I would start the count over. Now, fast forward to June. And I think by uh, it was April and May, I flew. I was so comfortable and relaxed. I actually fell asleep on the flight, which is huge. I like, ate breakfast. I looked out the window. I chatted. I fell asleep. And that was in a short period of time. Wow. So tell and us I, how bad you were. Yeah. So because because when you look at this into the time period, people go, ah, yeah, that's, that's nothing then. So, But you yeah. must have been pretty bad. So tell us a little bit about it. So let's dwell for a moment. Let's dwell in the pile O-S-H, you know, what, what, what? Because <laughs> that's what it feels like. If I go, I was trying to figure out where did this fear of flying come from? Mm. Um, because I grew up fearless, but occasionally ill on planes, physically ill. I would just get motion sick, but I was still fearless. I had no no fear of flying. And I was a classical musician. So I traveled all over Japan, Europe, all over the US. I flew long haul flights, short flights, flights over mountains, anything. And the worst that would happen was occasionally I would get ill and need to vomit in the bag, which was mortifying and embarrassing. (laughs) But but it never really stopped me because I always knew that once I got sick, I felt better. Mm. Um, So I would say then I was fearless, but occasionally ill. And then I was also then switched my career, drifted into teaching more yoga, which I also traveled all over the country for that as well. So it was really hard for me to pinpoint when did my anxiety really spike. And if I look back, I can really pinpoint it to two things, one good thing and then one biological shift. So one really good thing is that almost 15 years ago, I got married 
and it was fantastic, great relationship. But the first time I flew with him, I got super anxious. And it was like this fear of You can losing. tell me, you, you're amongst friends. Was it his fault? <laughs> it's, it's, your secret is safe, honestly. No, it was not his fault. In fact, I, 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 it's, but it's around the same time though, Paul, that I, looking back, of course, hindsight's twenty twenty. I started mm. to feel the perimenopause symptoms coming on. So I have generalized anxiety disorder already. And I've right. dealt with it my whole life and sort of managed it through yoga. And then perimenopause happened, but I wasn't yet aware that that was happening. So I would have See. these spikes of anxiety. And I've heard this is common, right? I'm not mm, the only one. That's true, um, yeah. Yeah. So it was sort of like those two things of flying with him and that sort of fear of, of loss, really, this fear of losing. Yes, I yes. finally have found this very precious love it's very precious relationship. And then also my body is going, oh, and by the way, you're sort of going through, like I call it reverse puberty because that like unsettled feeling you have when you're a teenager and out of sorts and you don't know which way is up, that's what it feels like, but you're not really expecting it. So right around the same time, it started to get pretty bad anxiety where I was just managing myself through every flight, one breath at a time, using all of my yoga breathing, mm -hmm. meditation, but it took all of my power, like the two weeks leading up to a flight and on the flight just to make it through. And then I'd land and be exhausted, right? Because yeah, I'm exhausted that. from the effort of making it through. Yeah. But I think it was still tempered because I was still flying a lot for teaching yoga. So I was just through exposure, sort of keeping my anxiety in perspective, but then cue the pandemic. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> like everyone else, I was grounded. So no more exposure therapy for Gita. And I like forgot all about it. And then come March of 2022, and I'm gonna fly again. And I freaked the mm, out. <laughs> I couldn't sleep at night. I lost my ability to sort of manage my thoughts. I would go right to catastrophe thinking. If I mm. saw a plane in the sky, I would think, oh, I'm gonna be on that plane and I'm gonna go down in a fiery crash and it's gonna all be over. I mean, just went from zero to 60. Yes. It was awful, not sleeping well, full on anxiety. Fear of vomiting came up, fear of panic on the flight, fear of loss of control, fear of claustrophobia. Like when you have generalized anxiety disorder, it's a little bit like, you wake up in the morning and your anxiety goes, what am I going to be anxious about today? It could be anything. It mm. could be a, you know, a butterfly goes by and somehow anxiety will latch onto that. So every like negative thought people have posted in the Facebook group, I went through in like this total storm for two weeks before my flight in March. I mean, it was absolutely taking over my life. I, you know, I was teaching and doing all these lovely things, but in the back of my head, it was like, I'm going to die in a fiery, awful crash and it's going to be horrible. <laughs> like it was completely out of control, filled with dread. That's how I would describe it. Well, mm. I'm not surprised if that's what you were visualizing. Crikey. I mean, that's yeah. And so that's then the flight that I got on. That's around the time that I started to look for other resources beyond what I had done before, which was do my own meditation on the flight, do my breathing that I know from yoga, do my deep relaxation that I know from yoga on the flight. And I would say the thing that kept me from canceling that trip of flying to Chicago was one memory I had of a flight that was a real mind warp. So I was on a flight, I don't know, it was before the pandemic at some point, I was flying back from training at an ashram. And this was right around the time when perimenopause was kicking in. And I was just sitting on the flight, happy, la, 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 having my tea and my cookies. Singing then, by the sound of it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, <laughs> well, that's a frequent sitting occurrence. To you. Oh, gosh, she's on. <laughs> it's the singing yogi again. <laughs> oh, yeah, I am a music teacher. What can I say? We sing a lot. So, so I'm on this flight. I was, yeah, but I was so happy. And then all of a sudden, like, I felt like the prickly feeling of a panic attack coming like out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what is happening? And so I said, okay. And then I was panicking that I was going to panic. Listeners, can you relate? Nod your heads. <laughs> like I was panicking that I was going to panic. I didn't know anybody what's going to happen. I'm on this flight. It's going to be embarrassing. How do I explain this to people? 
And I said, well, what can I do? So I put on my headphones and I have a recording of one of my teachers leading a guided relaxation. Mm -hmm. And this guided relaxation is very specific to, to the tradition of yoga I follow, which is a very traditional practice which involves the whole entire lifestyle. So it sort of is beyond just the physical poses. It's really the whole philosophy and living that way of being a person of service and a person of love and a person of devotion. So this deep relaxation is like, it takes you through relaxing your body and then kind of relaxing your breath. And then you go to this place where you observe your mind. So I went, I was listening to my teacher and I was half of me was like in full on about to have a panic attack. Like that tunnel vision thing was happening that happens yeah. with a panic attack. And it was like tunneling in, but half of me was doing this yoga nidra, which means yogic sleep. So I was like, I felt like I had a foot in both worlds. And what was bizarre, Paul, was the flight attendant came by at that moment and she motioned over her face like she was washing her face. And I couldn't hear the jets and everything. I was like, the engines rather. I'm like, what? I took out my earbuds. I'm like, excuse me, what? And she said, your face, you're just, you're glowing. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I must have looked at her like she had eight heads because I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? Excuse me, I, I'm, I'm trying to have a yoga sleep and you're waking <laughs> me up to tell me I'm glowing. Yeah. And part of me is about to panic and yeah. freak yeah. the flip out and like yeah. run up and down this plane screaming because that's, I was- Screaming and glowing. Don't mind. <laughs> exactly. That's pretty much yoga. It's like, oh yeah, life is hard and we deal with it. That's pretty much it. So I thought Sorry, that I interrupt your story. I couldn't resonate. resist a gag, you know. I love it. No, but that's exactly it, right? That's exactly the dual perspective that I had in that moment of like, mm. you can absolutely be almost at a panic attack point and simultaneously be watching yourself doing that and not necessarily get completely caught by it. And there was something about that moment that in those days up to when I was about to fly again after the pandemic opening up that I was like, if I made it through that experience and someone else subjectively looked at me and said, hey, like you look, you know, la la la, radiant being of light. <laughs> like there's something there though, right? I, I was like, there's something here that I'm supposed to learn. I have to go through this to, to figure out what, what is, mm. what am I supposed to learn through this experience? So that got me on that flight and I went through that flight, like I said, three breaths at a time. Uh, it was inhale through the left nostril, exhale through the night, right nostril one. Inhale through the right nostril, exhale through the left nostril two. Inhale, left nostril, exhale, right nostril three. What are you gonna do now, Gita? Do that again. And I'd start that over for freaking two and a half hours. Mm. That's all I did because I that just- That sounds exhausting. It was exhausting, but what was interesting is that when I got off the flight, I had tons of energy. I didn't feel like I did the other times when it was like just white knuckling it through and every, every little dip or every little jilt, I was mm. freaking out. Yeah, There was something about that focus. It was just like a meditation practice that I do on the ground. I just did it in the air, even though there was still that part of me that was very panicky, fearful, the heart was racing, sympathetic nervous system, kicking out stress hormones. Yeah, More of me was managing it. And I think that was the biggest lesson and for anyone listening. It is entirely possible to be having a crappy experience. And at the same time, there's part of you that's learning how to just handle it. So, and then when I, I'm just talking a lot, but I think maybe- Oh, I'm no, that's what I like. I, I, prefer guests, <laughs> I prefer guests to talk more than me. That's, that's okay. the sole objective. But sometimes I just have to say something stupid. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's in my DNA. I love it. And then when I was in Chicago, I had a talk with my dad that also really shifted things for me. And then I can get down to brass tacks and tell people really tactically what happened, because this is all getting a bit metaphysical, but you ask Gita to be on and that's yeah, how I good. roll. Yeah, so, yeah, I, was, I so, wasn't expecting the Dalai Lama, but you know, <laughs> here we are. So my father is a World War II veteran. He was in the Navy and he actually, after the Navy, uh, he was a college professor, taught chemistry, and he also flew sailplanes. So this is a plane without an engine, <laughs> which is like, for me, who's like, you know, not sleeping a wink for like weeks before a flight because she's so freaked out. I was like, perhaps 
I should talk to my father mm. <laughs> about his experience, you know, hello. So I asked him, Hey, tell me about what, what was it like being a glider pilot? Like what, tell me more as I saw him as a kid fly and I'd be his ground crew and I would look at the plane up there, but I never really had these longer chats with him. And he told me he would describe it as being nervous. Although I, you know, now we would use the word anxious. <laughs> My dad has, you know, there's like, he said, every time I went up, I was nervous every single time. Mm-hmm. I was like, well, how, cause it's not, it's not a dangerous thing, but it's not without its challenges to fly a glider. And he did long distance flying too. So not just sometimes for those who don't know, they just tow the glider up and then they release the, the um, tow plane from the glider. And then they just glide back down to the airport. But my dad would do flying where they would tow him up and he would find the thermals, which is those rising columns of air. He would find those thermals and ride those to a point in the distance and then find another thermal and ride to a point in a distance. So he would do distance flying, which is much different than being towed up and then just gliding right back down to earth. So he was kind of a well, That's very say, cool, very cool. I was going to say yeah, a bad yeah. A, but I don't know if we can swear on the podcast. <laughs> <That's totally laughs> like. So he told me about this time that like really sh- I thought really shifted my perspective. And I thought if he can do this, how come I can't change the way I think about things? So he said that at one point his instructor looked at him and said, you're ready to do higher altitude flying. You're ready to go up to 30,000, 40,000 feet, which is there's only specific places in the world. You can do that in a glider because you have no engine to get you up there. You have to ride the thermals. You have to ride the air currents to get there. So this was out in California. And he said, the, the air goes up and over the mountains where it rises, it crashes down the side of the mountain. Then when it hits the earth, doesn't hit the earth, when it reaches the earth, <laughs> the air then rises up sharply. And you can ride that thermal up mm. to 30 or 40,000 feet, even without an engine. But you have to have skill. He had to have oxygen because he needs oxygen. And he had to wear like a special suit because it's very cold up there. And glider is just the fuselage in you. So I'm like, how did you never tell me this? You know, you're in your nineties and I'm almost 50. So he said that one day he was, as he called it, banging around in the turbulence for an hour because he couldn't find the rising thermal. He knew it was there, but he was like, I was just banging around in this like bumpy chop for an hour, trying to find the lift to get him up higher. And he finally did find that column of air and rose up to about 35,000 feet. And I thought, oh, wow. fearless flyers, can you believe being intentionally in bumpy turbulence in a plane without an engine for an hour? And I was like, wait a minute. He said, well, yeah, when you're in a glider, you want turbulence. You want to feel that air current because if you don't, it means that you have to get down to earth quickly because that's the thing that's keeping you aloft in a glider. And it totally switched my perspective. And I was like, it's all just air. (laughs) It's all just air that's moving. (laughs) That's all it is. And to certain planes, it needs that. Just like we see the the seagulls on the ocean, you know, flying above or a hawk or here on New England, we have osprey, the sea eagles that ride those thermals. So then he goes on the ultimate, just total amazing move. He finally finds this, he raises all the way up to 35,000 feet. And then, I mean, this is back. So this was when he took sabbatical. It must have been 68 or 69. This is going a ways back in aviation history. But along comes a jet. And it's a passenger jet, passenger plane with like 100 people on board. And he said the jet slowed down and did a big banking turn all the way around my dad. And then it did another one. My dad said the whole time, because my dad is basically stationary at this point, because he's just in the thermal and just like Mm. a bird at the ocean, just it's just hovering. That's what he was doing. He was just hanging out up there. And the jet went around once and then the jet went around twice and then went on to California. And eventually my dad went down and landed and he asked his teacher. So I was up there and whatever, whatever call sign, you know, he gave was circled twice. And his teacher said, oh, yeah, he wanted to show off to his passengers what a sailplane can do and what it can do. So he was probably saying, Shh, ladies and gentlemen, if you look out of your left window, you'll see a sailplane and 858. <laughs> so that he's giving them like, so little, like cool. isn't that like so cool? And so that something in that was like, why am I then on a plane white knuckling it 
yeah, or yeah. not, especially for me, the anticipatory anxiety, spending two weeks up to it, certain that I'm going to die, certain that the world is going to end and it's going to be awful and horrible and scary and tragic and all of those things. If he can do that, like, why can't I? <laughs> like, why isn't that available to me? And why isn't it available to everybody out there? So I, I mean, I just think it's an amazing story. First it's a great all. story. I love, the, I love the story. And you obviously come from a very good stock. That's, uh... Yes, I do. My parents are really <laughs> tremendous individuals. And, and so with that, then I really doubled down on the Love Fly group and also a Captain Ron's uh, Fearless oh, Flyers. Yeah, great, yeah. It's fantastic. Uh, him being a captain, that was also helpful to me. And I said, okay, I, I have to do something even more. There's this existential crisis, right? Of like, clearly I have a fear, a fear of death which I need to deal with on a spiritual level as a spiritual seeker, I, I need to face that and really be honest about what that means for my life. And is that limiting me or is that going to be a doorway to deeper understanding? So there's that side. But then on a very practical, I'm in a human body, I, I need to deal with this on every level, physical, mental, emotional, um, psychological. So you want I can't to wait this? to hear what happened. Keep going. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I'm hooked. He's hooked. Okay, great. So um, from the purely the more, I would say sort of like the metaphysical level of this fear of death thing, which I loved when I read your book, you said like within the first chapter or two, like, hey, people, we have to talk about it. It's ultimately what's going on for most people is that they're afraid of this of death. Like you, you, you mentioned it, right? Right in the, the beginning parts of the book. And I was like, oh, thank you. Can we just please talk about it instead of pretending like, we're afraid of the plane. It's usually something else going on there. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's very much this notion, um, and we have it in yoga, we talk a lot about, we have sort of two reactions to life. We're either like totally averse to it, like, I don't like it, I don't want any more, get away from me. Or we cling to it, I like it, I want more, we, we hold on to it, right? So it's like aversion or attraction. And we constantly are in one or the other. And then we wonder why we're so miserable all the time. <laughs> because we're either trying to push things away, you know, I don't like you, get away from me. Or I want more of that, so more chocolate. And neither one of those ultimately leads to us feeling really permanently happy. So I realized that if I'm so in this, state where I'm going between this aversion and this attraction, then what is the more middle path for me? Mm -hmm. And so the more middle path then is to think, well, I'm afraid of dying. Okay, Gita, let's be real. So my meditation, I have a technique that my teacher taught me, which is like, literally, you put your fear in a chair, and you talk to it like it's a friend. And you know, the old yogis, they were like just the first positive psychologists. It's we, we, that's a whole nother conversation you and I can have over tea someday. But <laughs> there's so much in the ancient scriptures about positive psychology. It's just different language because it was 6,000 years ago. But you put your fear in a chair and you just talk to it. So I did that and I said, OK, so you're afraid of dying. You're averse to this thought of dying. So you're trying to avoid it by any means possible. And what is it you're so afraid of? It's like, well, I'm afraid that I won't have accomplished everything I'm supposed to. Well, why? And I just kept digging. Well, why are you afraid you won't accomplish everything? What does that mean? And ultimately I would get down to this feeling of like, well, I'm just not really good enough, right? I'm just not, I need to keep proving that I'm good enough. I need to write like another article or teach another class or get another degree, more, 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 right? And I was like, what would happen if I just let that go and just said, if you're here and you're drawing breath, then you must be doing what you're supposed to do. And when you're not supposed to draw breath, then you'll be done. Like, what if I just unhooked myself from that narrative, right? Of I have to do more in order to have worth. And that really actually helped a lot because I saw, and being 50, I saw and I see my friends who have that aversion piece of their life and they let that drive them a bit more. And myself too where it's like life becomes then this shrinking set of possibilities and it shrinks and it shrinks and it shrinks. Well, I don't fly because I don't like it. Well, I don't eat that food because I don't like it. Uh, I don't do that because I don't like, and it just shrinks and it shrinks and it shrinks until the very thing that you're trying to protect, you end up suffocating it. 
you end up killing it. And it's like that I just get chills and I could start crying because it's like you're trying to avoid dying, but in clinging on, you actually end up killing the very thing you love. So it's a, such a tough lesson of letting go. It's not easy. It makes me want to oh, cry. I love that. I, love that. <laughs> I don't know if I said this in the book, but there was this phrase that we used to say when I was an early trainer. I haven't said it for years. I'll repeat it now. So apologies if you heard it. But they say when you when you get stuck in a rut, the difference of being in the rut and in your grave is a matter of depth. <laughs> I don't know if it's it. relevant, but you know, I used to, when I used to run, yeah, twenty odd years ago, I was running change management type stuff. Uh, yeah, that was a little phrase we used to say. Never really thought about it again until you just said that. Yeah, it is really. It's this illusion of safety can become a prison, right? Mm. It became can become the rut that you're stuck in. So you have this illusion of safety. Oh, I don't do that, so I'm safe. Well, I don't do this because I'm yeah, safe. Yeah, it's nonsense, isn't it? Because, you know, the, as was one of the pilots said on the recent podcast, and this is true, um, and also Dr. Barber said this, you know, you're more likely to get killed or die at home than you are in an aircraft, you know, yeah. so people keep themselves safe and uh, not doing stuff. Yeah. They'll probably slip over in the shower. Maybe. Yeah. Absolutely. And it becomes this it becomes a prison then because you don't have freedom. You don't have mental freedom. It's not just that you have to have big adventures in order to be a free person, but you have to have mental freedom inside your own head. And that's really the the illusion of control was another big thing that I was confronting in my meditation. We've all done it, haven't we? All do it. We've all done it. Yeah. 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 And, you know, it's something that I was taught in all of my yoga trainings and I teach my yoga students and I have to continually remind myself is people say, oh, I just don't like being out of control. And it's like, oh, if you think you have control of your life, you're working so hard on that illusion that you're spending so much energy propping up that illusion. So when anything comes poking into it, then that aversion kicks in and you push it away like violently. When you find, mm -hmm. when I find myself having that really strong negative reaction, I don't want to go to that. I don't want to see that person. That's too late at night. It's too early in the morning. Whatever my excuse is, that's that my my illusion of control is being challenged. And so my thing is then to kick the messenger <laughs> instead of go, wait a moment. Are you really in control in quotes? Because even though we talk about using the breath as a way to manage anxiety or stress, we can't even control that. No one can inhale and then hold it for five minutes or 10 minutes. Some people can, free divers can, I know, but even at a certain point, right? <laughs> you have to inhale or exhale. Like we don't have that control. We don't have control over other people. We barely even have control over our thoughts. So the only way we get control is this paradox of letting go of control. Just pause there. Let's just let. Oh, that's a good one. Let that one hang for a moment. <laughs> say it again. That's good. The only, I have no idea. What did I say? What planet am I on? Where am I? <laughs> You're in podcast land. Uh, I don't know where you are. <laughs> I'm in coastal England. No, no, no. The only way that we actually have control is to let go of control. Mm. How do you do that? How do you? How do you do that? Yep. How did you do that? So, and this is where then we can turn into some brass tacks of, of how to address this. So the first thing I think is, is to mentally recognize all the ways and to actually, I like to do, a, I'm clearly an analytical person. <laughs> so I like to analyze the ways that I think I actually have control and really pick it apart and like prove to myself that like, no, you actually don't. So the classic one is I'll, I'll tell or I'll tell a student, OK, take a breath in and they take and I said, OK, now hold it. I'll be back in half an hour and you should still be holding your breath. And then they usually laugh because they know they can't. I'm like, you can't even do that. So why do you think you have control? Well, I have more control when I drive. Uh, really? Can you control if you get a flat tire? No. Can you control if a deer runs in the road? 
No. Can you control if a manhole cover flies up, which does happen here in Boston? Hello. <laughs> um, no, you can't control no, that. I speak to somebody about it. Yeah. Oh my gosh, it's that's a whole other topic. Um, all these, what can you control and make another person love you? No. If anyone has ever taught kids, which I do, can you control a group of fifth graders to do quote unquote what you want them, make them do yoga? No, you can't. And even if you do force that control on someone and behaviorally they're doing what you want them to do, they're still free to think their own thoughts about the experience. Mm -hmm. You're not actually controlling them, right? So you can take anything, people, that you think you're controlling and really pick it apart. And I guarantee you, you're not. You're, we're more like, it's more like surfing instead of trying to control the ocean is how I would describe this thing. So I'm just going to surf with what is happening instead of trying to yell at the ocean and want it to be different. That's how you let go mentally. <laughs> In fact, that's very similar to, not very similar, it's, it reminds me of something that Paul Barber said in the last podcast, and he was talking about the gestalt thing with the, the, mm. the turbulence, and his was like going with it, going towards it rather yeah. than away from it. Yeah, and that's the aversion attraction, right? Instead of spending mm. all this energy blocking it, or like I was in that first flight, just sitting there and breathing and trying to block everything, and all this mental energy to try and keep it away, relax into it and explore what's there for you and trust that you can handle it. So, okay, let me get back away from metaphysical land. Otherwise, this will go on for oh, another hour and a half. Yeah, yeah. This is going to be one of those podcasts that, that you know, when it finishes, because we the sweet spots, like, as you know, about 50 minutes to an hour yeah. and generally. But uh, this is but quite often people say I could have listened for longer. So there could be a part two, geetic part two, <laughs> if people ask for it. <laughs> and you want, and you can bear it but keep going so so tell us then so from march to june there was yeah. quite a shift huge shift so it was a lot of this that i'm talking about right is for me this is the language that i speak as, as a spiritual seeker and as someone who is really using the, the spiritual life as a way to get to know myself better in order to also serve other people and just to enjoy life have some joy i like to if there is a darkness or a fear I like to figure it out for myself. And even if I can't figure it out, at least use it as a, as a doorway to understanding myself. So I was like, well, there's a big doorway there and it's dark and scary. So let's open that one. <laughs> so, but then there was so much practical stuff that I said, I'm going to use the technique of flooding. And it's, I don't know which, I think it was some music teacher along the way. This is things we do in classical music training, where if we have like, say um, a really long piece, like maybe not even a long piece, but a very challenging piece, like the, the Poulenc Sonata for clarinet and piano, it's three movements. It goes all over the place, beep, 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 it's high, it's low. It's very technically demanding on the chops. So by the time you get done playing it, you're like, <laughs> so we would do flooding which is you play it all the way through all three movements. And as soon as you're done, you go back and you play it all the way through again. The idea being that, of course, you'll be complete rubbish the second time through. <laughs> but then when you I love using these British phrases, <laughs> I don't know somehow you've inspired me. Um, somehow then when you get on stage to just do it one time through, then it seems easy. And then this flooding too of, of overdoing everything. So I said, okay, I'm going to use this flooding technique for flying. And I'm mm -hmm. going to go to every expert, every podcast, every book, every group. And I'm just every day, I'm going to dedicate myself to like an hour or two of just, if I'm, if I'm taking a walk, I'm listening to a podcast. If I'm cleaning out the chicken yard, I'm going to be listening to something else. And just in, instead of the nonsense messages of my brain, which goes from zero to catastrophe thinking in about five seconds, <laughs> I was going to flood it with the opposite message, right? The opposite, not necessarily even positive, but just the opposite reality based message, like my dad talking about turbulence. So things I did were very, I read your book. Uh, I read Captain Ron. I read his book your podcast, which I sort of discovered later in the game. So I have a lot of catching up to do. Yay! A big piece of it was the Love Fly group and also Captain Ron's Fearless Flyers group as well. That was huge because 
actually admitting to other people and to my husband, who I didn't even tell for years, by the way, I keep having nightmares and I can't sleep at night. And like every time I talk that I'm going to Chicago in the back of my head, I'm like, and I'm going to die <laughs> is going on. <laughs> there was really freeing to like actually admit it and scroll through and see other people mm -hmm. on their victory flights, even if they're like, I cried and I shook and it was so hard, but I did it. And I was like, oh, there's people who are actually going to care if I do this, even if I'm even if I'm a mess, they're going to be like so proud of me instead of always doing it on my own, which is a really bad habit I have of trying to do it all myself. And then another thing that really helped, too, was on social media, following captains and following flight attendants, because. Uh, podcast listeners, if you haven't figured this out, there's like people out there who love aviation. <laughs> <laughs> and the way I geek out on yoga and metaphysical talk and, you know, the nature of the universe and the clarinet and or whatever your passion is, people geek out on aviation. So I was and just seeing their their social media feed of what they're doing. It was like this completely different perspective. Mm -hmm. And then I went down the rabbit hole of people who own their own planes and fly them. And those people seem so approachable because they're not like the captain in the suit up in the front with the disembodied voice of when they say, just sit back, relax and enjoy the flight. And I want to like punch him in the face. <laughs> like, yeah, how dare you? <laughs> you come down here with your big talk. <laughs> exactly. I'm like gripping the armrest every little dip. I'm like, ah! So seeing just regular old people learning how to fly and flying these little Pipers and Cessnas and saying, mm. wow that really helped too. it really personalized it and again just giving myself a different narrative a different set of thoughts to think and then i'm also the daughter of two phd scientists so learning even more about flight really helped i knew a lot from my dad about weather patterns and what to look for i know what a good day is to fly a sailplane <laughs> like I, i'll look out and be like "Ooh, cumulus clouds there's good lift today not that i fly one but i said maybe i can learn more about jets and modern aviation so I started, I'm driving my husband nuts now because every time he mentioned something, he took a flight recently and it was a bumpy landing where he said, oh, it was a bad bumpy landing. I'm like, no, no, that was a good landing. That means they stuck the landing. They want that. They don't want that moment where the wheels softly touch down because the plane is unstable then. He's like, oh my God. I hate you, yes. <laughs> yeah. There's Gita with another fact about aviation. Um, so I literally <laughs> flooded my system with like every fact bit of information and it really, really helped to normalize the experience. And so just, I, just a question yeah. then, cause I think yeah. I love that. How, how long do you think it took for that, the shift in oh, mindset, yeah. the shift in mindset. And, you know, I was, I was perhaps, I want to, it, it was about a month is the short answer. And. I do want to prime that by saying that um, I'm a bit obsessive. So there's that. And I also do not have children, which is huge. I really want to acknowledge that for my friends who have kids or who, who are caring for elder parents. When you have a lot else going on with your life, it maybe give it more than a month, you know, <laughs> like because I I live a very relaxed, easeful life and I was in a relaxed, easeful place in my life, right? Like the timing was right for mm. me to kind of tackle it. And there's been other times in my life when I know that that would not have been possible, you know, going through illness, recovery, uh, things like that, uh, going through my divorce, that would not have been a time to address it. You know, it was like, do what you can to make it through and baby steps. So I was sort of primed to do this and I was highly motivated. Yes, I was yes. like, I'm turning 50. I do not want to spend the rest of my life being this person who flies, but hates it. Right. I was like, it's time for me to actually get back to that teenager who would get on a plane to go to Tokyo with her bass clarinet and a Rolling Stone magazine and be happy as a clam for like 14 hours. Like, you know, like I want to be her again, you know? So I was really motivated to actually really enjoy it. And that helped. So it was about a month. Oh, the other thing that really helped was watching a lot of videos that people have shot, thank God for the internet, from inside of a plane as it takes off. You know, just like people, they have their mm -hmm. cell phone and they just take a video of 
of, and so I was actually able to fly, find videos of flying in and out of Chicago, in and out of Denver, in and out of Boston, which were places that I was going. So I could see what I was going to see and have that bit of knowledge that really helped. And I would actually have those videos. Some people have them, they're like two hours long. They'll video the whole flight. It's like from their seat in the plane. <laughs> so I'd have that open in a window on YouTube and the volume up loud in my headphones and I'm a writer and then I'd be writing while that was playing. So it was like I was on the plane while I was doing my normal little activities of writing my articles and things. That love really that. helped. It I really helped. That. So and then occasionally I'd look out the window, which I was looking at the computer, like look out the plane. Oh, and now we're over Chicago. Cool. <laughs> that is really good. I mean, that is it really helped. Yeah, because you're you're priming. You're doing exactly what you know. You take someone like I say this in the book. I think probably you know racing car drivers. Yeah. They go through that. They visualize all the turns. They watch it. Yes. Hundreds of times before they do even go on there, and then they do yeah. that when they have got on there, and it's just that. Yeah, because the the brain can't tell the difference, can it? So if you if you yeah. the imagination is such a great thing that you can if you practice it and yes. imagine yourself, you do it enough times, you are actually preparing yourself. There's no different yeah. to preparing for a speech or doing anything. It's just practice, practice drilling it. Love yes. that. That's brilliant. Absolutely, visualization that the body doesn't know the difference. Absolutely, mm. if you visualize something like you're really, we do this in classical music all the time. If you have to a big performance, it's going to be full of pressure and you know, like the people that make you nervous are going to be there. You actually visualize it and they put these musicians in these MRI machines and they see that those areas of the brain light up. Even if you're not playing your clarinet, the areas of your brain light up in the motor pathways as if you were playing your clarinet, if you really strongly imagine that you're on the stage with the people looking at you. So you can induce that sort of feeling. Uh, you just have to really give yourself in to the imagining of it mm. um, and let the feelings come and know that you're just sitting on your couch you can be nervous <laughs> and you can work through it that way so all of those things really really helped and then i also had a list of 30 things <laughs> like i'm such a geek i forgot i even did this i had it because my anxiety was really spiraling and i was like okay you have to just do something. So I made a list of 30 things I could do on the plane if I felt anxious. <laughs> and it was just like I made myself brainstorm like everything that I thought I could do. And that I didn't even end up looking at the list, but it was something mm. with my preparatory anxiety to help me. You know, yeah. you could talk to the person next to you. You could ring the flight attendant. You could get up and go to the bathroom. You know, you could do your little yoga routine, et cetera, et cetera. But I had sort of my stock things that I would do on the plane and something that ha helped me when I was actually on the flight is definitely, I know everyone says it, I feel like who comes on your podcast, breathing, breathing, breathing. And being a yoga teacher and someone who is also a classical musician who uses a wind instrument, I'm pretty familiar with my breath and most of the time able to access that as a resource, but it doesn't it's not always accessible, just different sinus issues or air pressure. So I also have a mantra that I use, which is a, a phrase in Sanskrit, which means peace. And so I mentally can repeat that mantra, which is very helpful, listening to uplifting music, et cetera, et cetera. But there's something too that I think really helped me on the, the plane and to sort of depersonalize the anxiety, which is a big one. I wanna make sure to tell people, especially if you're someone out there who has anxiety regularly, and it just magnifies on the plane, please do not ignore that. Because Captain Ron said this, and it just hit me between the eyes like, ah, oh. he said, if you go into a flight with your anxiety already like off the charts, just in your daily life, and then you add the stressor of flying on top of that, what do you think is going to happen? <laughs> you know, yes, yes. like he said, do everything you can to get your mental health in a very positive place overall and then begin also working on this. And I really took that to heart. So of course I dialed up my yoga practice and all of that. And then it got me thinking though, that for someone who experiences anxiety, very often the physiological stress of flying will trigger the feeling of discomfort, which then I will interpret as anxiety 
which then I interpret as a psychological problem, which then I interpret as it must be me. I'm such a mess. Oh my God. And then the spiral mm. is off and running when really it's a physiological problem. Sometimes there's that existential fear that we need to face, but sometimes it's just for me, very fast motion or motion that my eye and ear can't figure out which way is up where I'm going. That's a physiological problem. And I know as a yoga teacher, physiological solutions, different movements I can do with my body to turn my sympathetic nervous system off and to turn my parasympathetic nervous system on, which is going to help me to be more stable. So though that's a little maybe more information than you want but there are certain movements that i know i can do that will sort of down regulate my nervous system which is a game changer for me mm. a very somatic a very body-based person i need to know that i can move in certain ways that are just going to turn off that panic that's just happening because my body is being moved in such a weird way so how would someone learn about that where, where could they go to that sounds very intriguing. Well, it's um Is there a they, Gita app? <laughs> the Gita app, take a deep breath. <gasps> <laughs> and then you're fine. <laughs> so it's a really uh, a simple, I can give the really, really, really short answer to it, which is that anytime and this is like yoga teacher 101. So if you go to any good, what we call Hatha yoga, which is the physical practice of yoga, any really good Hatha yoga class, especially something called gentle or accessible yoga. And I teach yoga to kids with special needs and, and folks who are, you know, in hospital beds and things like that. So I'm not from the school of you need to do, you know, sort of athletic movements, but more functional movement. The, the most basic thing that we can do is to do a forward bend. And you can do that when you're in the airplane, you can do it sitting in a chair. Anytime you lean forward, you, even like if I do it in a chair, I have my feet under my knees and I just hinge forward a little bit at the hips and rest my elbows on my knees and then kind of let my head rest in my hands. So I'm just bent at like, I don't even know what, what angle is that? It's not very much, I'm not all the way over. I'm just letting my head rest in my hands, elbows on the knees and just bent forward at that little angle and take deep breaths in that angle. That stretches the muscles along the spine. And anytime we do that, especially coupled with deep breathing, it is like a trigger that works on your body to turn on the parasympathetic nervous system, which is that part of the nervous yeah. system, which is tells us to rest and digest, which is the opposite of the fight, flight or freeze one that happens when we're about mm -hmm. to panic. Mm -hmm. And it happens, it doesn't matter what your mental state is, you can be in that state like I was about to have a panic attack, you can go into that forward bend, stay there, one, two, three minutes coupled with the deep breathing, and then slowly sit up from that. And I dare you <laughs> to not feel much better. <laughs> it's, it works like magic. I teach fifth graders and whenever they're just like, blah, 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 the class is just going bonkers. And I'm just like, okay, everybody sit down, crisscross, you know, they're fifth graders. So they sit down, crisscross, hands behind your back. Everyone take a deep breath in, open up and everybody hinge forward. And if you can't hinge forward, then just let your chin drop to your chest. That totally counts. You can just drop your chin to your chest. It's still a forward bend. They do whatever their version of forward bend is. They stay there. I talk very calm and soothing for a minute or two. And then I say, come up as slowly as you can, like molasses. They raise up and they all look like they're totally stoned on like good vibes. They're like, <laughs> and they almost inevitably go, Miss Gita, can we lay down now? And I'm oh, like, yes, yoga for the win. So a forward bend can literally be dropping the chin to the chest. Uh, if you know yoga, it's a child's pose. It can just be hinging forward, hands on the knees, make a little cradle with your hands and let your head rest there. That couple with some deep breaths is automatically soothing to the nervous system. You don't have to think or feel a different way. It's a way of using your physical body to shift your physiology, which then in turn changes your thoughts. And that's wow. how yoga works. I mean, that's, that's why yoga is empowering because it works from the outside in and the inside out. Eat yeah. gold, that is. Gold. Eat a gold. Eat a gold. 
There's a whole, I always feel like a little bit of a dork on the plane, but I'm 50 now, so I've gotten over it. I usually do a little routine about every 20 minutes on the plane of just circling my wrists, circling my ankles, pointing and flexing my toes. I do a little turn one way, a turn the other way. If I'm brave, I do a little side stretch and just let my body move in different ways because I know that that's very calming to the nervous system. And then 20 minutes goes by and I do that again. And I just, it, then I get off the plane and I feel much better. But I, I don't want to make all this sound like it's just, oh, now I fly and I'm like so happy because I did fly out to Denver and that was a challenging flight. That was in, mm. when was that? That was after, <laughs> that was April or May. So, and the flight there was, I got panicky because all of the, the shades were down and I couldn't see. And we but, started moving. Yeah. I'm like, are we moving backwards? Like what is happening? So I told the guy next to me, I got brave. And I said, can you please open your window a little bit? And he did. And that really helped. Um, and then I had a dark night of the soul before the flight on the way back. Uh, I was in bed the night before catastrophe thinking the whole thing again, right? Just off to the races, picturing certain crashes that I had read about thinking about them, you know, not sleeping. Uh, I was just a total mess. And I just went through that dark night of the soul, right? Like, is this how you're going to be for the rest of your life? Is this really the thoughts that you're going to choose mm. to have? Like, this is horrible. And I don't want to live this way anymore. Being in a Denver airport, contemplating how else am I going to get home to Boston? <laughs> like, it's ha like this, I can't do this anymore, right? I, ha I really had to face, it was really dark night of the soul. And by the time I got on the plane that next day, it was like it had sort of lifted because I had let myself just feel the terror, the fear. I admitted to my husband. I went on the Facebook groups and talked to people and talked to myself about it. And that was the flight then by the time I got on it and had breakfast, I was like, yeah, I think I'm just gonna be done with this. And then that's when I fell asleep and now since then, I'm like, get me back on a plane again. I'm so excited. <laughs> but there's something to just letting ourselves be a mess that was really freeing, just letting myself totally lose, lose mm. it before that flight and just go all the way into the deep, dark emotion and kind of reconcile myself to it somehow helped me to let go. My and here goodness. I am. Yeah, I'm amazing. like so excited. I'm flying a whole bunch more this year and I'm like, I can't wait. And I'm even contemplating going to a local airport and getting on one of those little putt putt planes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because I don't know if I want a pilot's license or not, but at least I can do, they have exploratory flights with those mm -hmm. where you can go up and they just, they show you for half an hour how the plane works and then they fly you around for half an hour and then you're done. I think that would be really empowering and it terrifies me. So I think that means that I have to do so it. It means you'll do it, yes. Of course you'll do it. You'll do it twice. And now I've said it on a podcast, so people will be like, yo, do you ever do that? You talk a good game is parasympathetic nervous system. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I mean, there's been so many good bits in that podcast. Oh, awesome. I can... Yay. Thank you. Thank there's, you. There's lots of... Uh, some lovely, lovely bits there and just very inspiring and some really practical things as well, which I think... Mm will help people because in that moment I always say just find one or two things to do that's do those it. things and that's it that's it practice yeah. them beforehand do them on the flight when you, you know, so you're not doing it but if you suddenly get taken by surprise do one thing you know whether it's Absolutely. a breathing with a sit forward whatever it is I love yeah. that that's really good yeah, thank you it's absolutely my pleasure. And thank you to everyone in the group, everyone who listens to the podcast. You're not alone. Thank you, especially to the people who lurk and who never comment or post, because I know you're out there and I know you get benefits and I know I can feel you. We're all in this together. Oh, amazing. Absolutely amazing. And and again, just like I said at the beginning, thank you so much for all the times that you do post and all the positive messages that you've been doing for people and the little uh, tuition bits as well. I spotted those. My pleasure. And I just thought you'd be a good... I just thought I'm going to see if you're up for it because you you were giving of your time and I thought I'm yeah. sure you've got this. So I've been I've been asking a few people if I see yeah. people coming up time and time again. I think oh, I must ask them. Yeah. Um, but some people I've I've just waited until they seem like 
they might want to talk. I don't know, yeah. it's just a gut instinct. I've just thought that Gita, she's up for it. All right, go on, give her, <laughs> give her a shout. She'll be up for it. <laughs> Your intuition was spot on. And that has absolutely been part of part of it for me is communicating with other people and talking mm. with them is so empowering to say I've been there and then I can share something and then what they say back about what I said helps me in the future. It's a way of keeping myself honest. It's like the AA method, right? Of like keep yeah. going to the meetings, keep checking in. It's just because I had a couple of good flights. It ain't over for me. I still have a long way to go with this to really be so confident in it. But it's just been a pleasure to share with everybody. No, oh, thank you. Oh, wow. <laughs> very good that was excellent thank you thank you thank so so you. much that's brilliant and keep doing what you're doing because it's it's so helpful to people i can see that the people respond to it and you're you're doing so much not expected but it's lovely when people do and i'm just grateful so thank you i think it's you and everybody else that does it as well i don't get to always thank people i try and get on there when i can but some, yeah. so, sometimes if someone puts a post on oh, yeah. i literally think well what should i put to that i look down and four people have replied already <laughs> yeah. and oh my goodness what's going on and they're like i landed and i'm fine you're like no yeah. oh, you sorry, that whole thing <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I could help. yeah uh, no it's brilliant thank you my pleasure thank you